This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company. For more information and links to all our great podcasts, visit HartmanMedia.com. Today we have Flashback Friday and a 10th episode show. All of you regular listeners know that every 10th episode we do a topic of general interest. It always seems to relate to finance and success in life and success with our portfolios, but the topics are more general every 10th episode show. And today we combine a Flashback Friday with a 10th episode. Welcome to the Creating Wealth Show with Jason Hartman. You're about to learn a new slant on investing, some exciting techniques, and fresh new approaches to the world's most historically proven asset class that will enable you to create more wealth and freedom than you ever thought possible. Jason is a genuine, self-made multimillionaire who's actually been there and done it. He's a successful investor, lender, developer, and entrepreneur who's owned properties in 11 states, had hundreds of of tenants and been involved in thousands of real estate transactions. This program will help you follow in Jason's footsteps on the road to your financial independence day. You really can do it. And now, here's your host, Jason Hartman, with the complete solution for real estate investors. Welcome to the Creating Wealth Show, episode number 800, another landmark in the show, episode number 800. Folks, I cannot believe we're already at episode 800. That is just, I'm totally ecstatic about that. And I want to thank all of you for supporting the show for the last 12 years or so, maybe a little more than 12 years, I'm not sure. We just appreciate our our family, our audience, and our clients so much, and just really appreciate having you here. Of course, I'm your host, Jason Hartman. I've got Naresh here with me today to help me with the intro portion of the show, and our guest today will be the very famous Grant Cardone. Yes, he's the 10X guy. This guy is so pumped up all the time on life. He's just a go-getter. <laughs> he's he's crazy. Grant Cardone. So he'll be with us here today in a few minutes. This interview was actually recorded a while back. I did publish it on one of my other podcasts, but I realized... We never published it on the Creating Wealth Show, so I'm glad to bring it to you today. These principles are timeless, not timely, but they can also be timely if you put them to work. And Grant is just all about thinking big and just going for it and 10xing your life, multiplying your returns in life. And that's what mastermind groups do for you, by the way. We've got our Venture Alliance Mastermind coming up in Las Vegas this weekend, and we've got a bunch of great guests coming this time, and they'll probably we all become new members. And if you want to check out Venture Alliance, check that out at VentureAllianceMastermind.com and also JasonHartman.com in the events section. We'd love to see you there this weekend. We could probably still fit a couple more people in if you act quickly. And you can come one time as a guest for a mere $2,000. And it's a first class weekend. This is not like our other seminars and events, our big ones. We've got the uh, former governor of Nevada speaking at this event. We've got Jason Hansen, who uh, is a former CIA operative, and he runs a thing called Spy Escape and Evasion School. He's got a great book that I finished, and he's speaking and also joining us for dinner on Saturday evening. We're going to start out Friday evening with Top Golf. And if you've never done Top Golf, it's a lot of fun. It's like a first class golf experience, and but it's real easy. It's not about golf, it's about having fun. We'll do our meetings at the Wynn Hotel on Saturday morning. We'll go out for some great meals. We're going to do a fun activity Saturday afternoon and Sunday afternoon. And it's just going to be a great weekend. So hope you can join us for that. And also for our upcoming Memphis Creating Wealth Seminar and Property Tour. Again, you can register for these at jasonhartman.com in the events section. And you can find out a lot more about them there too. So we hope you'll join us for both of those. Naresh. How are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you, Jason? Excited for your Venture Alliance? 
yeah, I'm really excited. This Vegas one is going to be awesome. They're all awesome, but in different ways. You know, they all have a different flavor. We do these four times a year, as you know. So it's a quarterly weekend event. And then once a year, we do a bigger trip. Last year, we went to Dubai. This year, we're debating where we're going to go. Maybe a European river cruise, maybe Cuba, Hawaii. I don't know. And and so it's really three weekends a year and then one longer trip each year that, you know, might be four or five days or something like that. Uh, You know, whatever people want to make it, really, it's up to them. Yeah, it's a great group, and it's high-level mastermind, and I can't stress enough the importance of masterminds. And Grant Cardone really made me think of that because, you know, his book entitled The 10X Rule that we're going to talk about today, which I think is really his best work. You know, that's what a mastermind group does. It helps you multiply your results 10x. So uh, our guest today is very fitting for that discussion. But hey, before we get to Grant, what's up with you, Naresh? Uh, What's keeping you busy in Florida? Well, the heat is February was I mean, I have my air conditioning on. And (laughs) you know, I was I was thankful because my friends in the Northeast were calling me and telling me how jealous they were. But like, it's really, really hot here. Right now we're recording early March. It's like 88 degrees outside. I'm not even making that up. You can look it up. So well, it's it's uh, warming up in Vegas too. So yeah, it's going to be warm for Venture Alliance next weekend. But it's been cold here. I mean, it's a little colder than Scottsdale. I'm kind of missing Scottsdale to be honest with you. But in the summer, it's also a little cooler in Las Vegas too. And of course, have I told you about no state income taxes? <laughs> yeah, yeah, and <laughs> and it's like. a good thing that you're having your Venture Alliance meeting there so that other people can see how awesome Vegas is. I've never visited. I'm visiting for the first time in two months. Yeah. But I think the the folks who visit for Venture Alliance will have a great time and they might even consider moving to Vegas. And like you mentioned earlier, great speakers coming in. We have the governor of Nevada, former governor of Nevada from uh, the late 80s to late 90s. He served all his terms and he's speaking to your group. That's pretty rare, but that's pretty awesome. Yeah, yeah, good stuff. No, he's going to be great. Thanks for booking him and Jason Hansen. And speaking of bookings, we just spent an hour, you and I, meeting on the phone and digging up some old interviews that have not been published yet for many of my different podcasts, including, of course, the Creating Wealth Show here. I can't wait to publish some of these. You know, there there are some real goodies in there that we just we just, you know, never got to publish because they've been in the lineup. And, you know, we try to publish things that are very uh, context sensitive as to what's going on in the news and so forth and what's going on in the world. So we, we kind of are always juggling all these different interviews and guests around to publish on the show. But here we're at episode 800. And some of these we recorded back maybe 100 episodes ago, but they're really valuable. And so we're going to get those out. So I'm, I'm really excited that we went, we, we sort of went onto the studio floor, if you will, as, as a metaphor. Obviously, that's not really true, but... <laughs> the virtual studio floor. The, the virtual studio floor, which means a file in my computer, and dug these <laughs> out, uh, out of the can, as they call them, like when, you know, when you're done with something in the studio, it's in the can, they say, meaning in the tin can where the film is kept. Today we have Flashback Friday and a 10th episode show. All of you regular listeners know that every 10th episode we do a topic of general interest. It always seems to relate to finance and success in life and success with our portfolios, but the topics are more general every 10th episode show. And today we combine a Flashback Friday with a 10th episode So, (laughs) yeah, and I can't wait to publish some of these for our listeners. So those are coming up, listeners. They're going to be great. Hey, I wanted to just tell you, uh, so a lot of listeners know that there is this one company that gets a lot of hype out there, and I think the hype is really the company is overrated. I, I don't think it's a bad company. I just think it's a highly overrated company, and I now have purchased my second product from them a few months ago, a big expensive product, a car a Tesla. And I got to tell you, folks, my second Tesla has not been a good experience. I've had tons of problems with it. And it's, it's just interesting that Tesla, when they first came out with a Model S and Consumer Reports rated them, it was the highest car ever rated by Consumer Reports, which I believe is a very credible company. I, I like Consumer Reports a lot. 
And, uh, and this one, the second one, the Model X that I have now has just been problem after problem after problem. And they came to look at it yesterday. And I got to tell you, I'm not too pleased. They're not doing too much for me, but I hope they get it together. You know, I talk a lot on the show about the self-driving car and how that's going to change the game of virtually everything in the world. And that's why, you know, I, I bought one Tesla, then I bought another because they are the most advanced in in the self-driving world, and uh, and they're the closest. And supposedly, my new car is capable, although <laughs> believe me, it's not even close to capable of being completely autonomous. And again, why is this important to real estate investors? Well, it's important to you because the game of real estate since the beginning of time has been valued on three primary issues. Location, location, and location. The three rules of real estate, as the old saying goes. And I believe that the autonomous car, the self-driving car, changes that and and dramatically shifts the power away from that concept. And I think I think we're gonna see big changes, folks. I think high priced properties that are priced high because of their location are going to see downward pressure. I believe we're going to see the resurgence of the suburbs. Um, I think the suburbs are coming back, and I think there's going to be a lot of value allocated away from high price properties with supremely expensive locations down to lower price properties with other features that people like, like low crime, uh, big yards, things like that. You know, again, this I, this is just part of the equation. There's more to it than this. This is not an absolute prediction, okay? But it's a factor. It's a big factor, too. It's not everything, but I think this is a big deal. So as we see, uh, you know, within maybe three years, a real impact of self-driving car technology, it's it's going to shift. This is a power shift. So be aware of it. It's not everything. It's not going to change everything, but it's it's a fairly big deal. I think our investor listeners need to be ready for that and really think about that. And coincidentally, most of the properties we're selling through our network are suburban properties. So there you go. <laughs> You're going to benefit from this with your investments, I hope, uh, because they will become more accessible to your renters. And some of the price value of the expensive properties will allocate and will shift toward the value equation of your properties, which will be great for you. I'm not sure, Naresh, I'm explaining this completely well. You know, sometimes there's something in your head that you just understand, or it's in your gut, or in your heart, and you just get it. I'm not sure if I'm conveying this message well enough to the listeners, so that's why it's great to have you here. Do you know what I'm saying? Does that make sense? I get what you're saying, but you said within three years. I'm not really sure about that. I would say you think it's going to catch on that quickly and have that an immediate effect. Well, it it you know again, like everything, this is it's incremental, right? I'm just saying that in three years, by the year 2020, I think we're going to see a a reasonably significant shift, not because every car on the road will be a self-driving car. It won't be. It'll only be a small percentage of the market by then. But this has come up a lot faster than most people think. Fernando, who has been on the show many times, you know, he was one of our, our biggest clients, and uh, now he works with us, and we own a, that software company together, realestatetools.com. He also is one of our investment counselors, and, and of course, people have met him at our live events and heard him speak and so forth. You know, he, I remember him saying to me as I was buying Tesla number one, that I'm so excited about this. And, and, you know, he worked for Apple, and he was a chip designer and engineer before he retired on real estate. And, you know, he said, Jason, you got to realize that from concept to R&D to product development to getting it in the hands of people, that cycle takes a long time. And, it even surprised him. He told me that one day. And then 
oddly, he ended up buying my Tesla, my first one from me. <laughs> so so he is now driving my old Model S. Of course, I had to take all the depreciation. So Fernando, you got quite a good deal for yourself there. But then I, I changed and got the other one that I had actually ordered previously uh, about 16 months before. He loves it. He, the self-driving technology, he just loves it. Now it's not fully autonomous yet. But what I'm saying is, that you don't need every consumer that owns an automobile to have a self-driving car for it to impact real estate prices because they can see it coming. They think, well, you know, this house is a little further away, a little longer commute than I'd like it to be. But, you know, my next car a year from now or two years from now, it'll probably be a self-driving car. And if it's not, the car I have now, or my next car, will be, you know, incrementally self-driving, like the Tesla is today, and uh, the Volvo, and the Audi. You know, a lot of these cars have some pretty great technology with the, you know, the variable laser-guided cruise control, and all kinds of anti-collision systems, and lane departure uh, systems that keep them in the lane, and so forth. And so, this is incremental. It's incremental in the sense that the product, the self-driving car, has varying degrees of self-driving technology, but it's also incremental in the psychology of people in that they, if they don't have it yet, they know it's coming and they can still make decisions on their real estate today based on saying, hey, I don't need to pay a massive premium for this super high-priced property in either rent or purchase price, one or the other, because in a year, I'm probably going to have a self-driving car, right? You know, in now in, in, in Pennsylvania, we've all heard, you can get an Uber that's self-driving. You In Tempe, Arizona, I just found out yesterday where I used to live in Tempe, right? You can, you can summon a self-driving Uber now. In a lot of cities, you know, they're rolling this out. This is coming fast. It's, it's not, this is right here. It's upon us and it's a big deal. So I just want people to realize that as real estate investors, that this is going to have an impact. And I, I don't really hear many people other than yours truly talking about it. I think it's very significant. So. Anyway, that's my thought. What are the issues that you are having with your Tesla? Like anything specific? Oh, God, that car has got so many problems. I'm so annoyed with them. And, you know, Tesla, it's like a cult, right? That whole company, everybody that works there acts like they're in a cult because they think they're working for the greatest company on earth and they get so much positive PR. A lot of that is just a sort of a leftist scam because they want to promote the electric car, which really is questionable as to whether or not that's even better for the environment. You know, that electricity is mostly produced from coal. Okay. And, you know, the, the manufacture of the batteries and the disposal of the batteries, there's a lot of environmental sins that take place there. So the jury is out on whether it's better environmentally. I'm, you know, I'm not driving a Tesla because I think it's better for the environment. I'm just driving it because I want a self-driving car. And my car, you know, they didn't disclose to me that the self-driving stuff didn't even work. You know, when I bought it, I, I still paid $117,000, which is insane. You know, and I drove it away and none of that stuff worked. And they keep saying, oh, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. And I believe them that it's coming. But Elon Musk is so famous for, you know, missing deadlines. It's like vaporware, right? They, they say it's coming, but when? I mean, it's not like I got a discount or I get to not pay my lease payments while it's coming. I'm still paying full price every month in my absurdly high lease payments on the car, but I don't have the features. So I'm pretty angry, actually. I got to tell you, I'm, I'm pretty disappointed with Tesla. I, I'm, I'm not happy. So anyway, but look, at, let's not make the show about this. We got to jump to Grant Cardone. You know, Naresh, thanks for listening to me vent. <laughs> yeah, no problem. It's a pleasure. And, and thank you listeners for listening to it also. So, uh, you know, you got to read between the lines with a lot of this hype you see in the media with everything, whether it be presidents, presidential candidates, politicians, Tesla, Apple, you know, whatever. It's all, there's always more to it than meets the eye. So that's good. But hey, let's jump over to Grant Cardone. We will talk to you on the next episode. This is a 10th show. So we talk about something of general interest, motivation, successful living, not specifically about real estate. Although I need to tell you, Grant Cardone is quite a real estate investor. 
I believe he said he owns about $300 million worth of real estate. Now, granted, he doesn't really own a lot of that, I don't think. He's syndicated a lot of that. Okay, so, you know, he was the guy who put the deal together, but, you know, with other investors. So that's always uh, something you got to understand in this stuff. But again, I don't have a lot of details on his real estate portfolio. I just know he's a big fan of real estate, not of owning the home in which you live, though, interestingly. And there's a big video that went quite viral about that, that Grant Cardone did. We're going to talk about 10x, about about multiplying your results times 10 today, and I think you'll really enjoy it. So Naresh, thanks. Let's dive in. Here's Grant Cardone. Check out jasonhartman.com and venturealliancemastermind.com and join us for our next couple events. Here we go. Hey, it's my pleasure to welcome Grant Cardone to the show. You've probably heard his name. He's a New York Times bestselling author, executive producer of the reality show Turnaround King, and the host of the Cardone Zone. And he's author of several books, one of them I just finished, which is entitled The 10X Rule. And he's coming to us today from Miami Beach. Grant, welcome. How are you doing? Hey, Jason. Thanks for having me. I'm doing great. Well, good, good. It's good to have you on. Tell us what you're up to nowadays. What's uh, what's keeping you most busy? You've got some great books. you got a new book out, Seller Be Sold. Old. And, uh, you know, maybe we'll talk mostly about the 10X rule because I just finished it. But uh, tell us what, what's going on. Yeah, uh, Jason, what, what am I up to? I'm, I'm, I'm up to hustle. I, I'm a hustler and uh, I, I like to work. I told my w- wife this weekend, I said, you know, I said, I'm sorry I was angry with you this weekend. I just didn't have enough. <laughs> Weekends are too long. I like producing. I like doing things. I like, uh, you know, I'm not I'm not a big vacation guy or so many parties or uh, the long weekends kill me. So I, li- I like to produce. I like to work. I like to hustle. I like to make my family proud of me. Uh, I'm extremely scared of the economic conditions, not just here in the U.S., but worldwide. And, um, you know, I want to make sure I can provide for them. So I'm always always got this hustle thing going. I'm getting ready to do a project with Steve Harvey where we go around the country, me and Big Steve. Uh, and talk to people about act like success. Well, what does it mean to act like success? Tell us about that. Well, I think you you and I were having a com- uh, a little bit of a conversation before uh, I got on, and, and it was like commit first, figure the rest out later. I mean, that's been really the theme. I love that. of my yeah. career. Uh, I was twenty five years old. I was broke. I had no money. I, I had an education that nobody valued. Um, I was in an economic condition where they weren't hiring. You know, the wrong time to be broke is when they're not hiring anybody. (laughs) Right. And here I came up broke financially. I was broke spiritually. I didn't like myself. I was like giving up on myself and my family had given up on me. And um, I'm like, one day I'm like, dude, you need to start acting like you're successful because this this thing, waiting for the right break, waiting to figure it out, waiting for something to happen just wasn't working for me. And uh, one day I was selling cars, actually. I was 25 years old. I'm like, okay, I hate this job. I hate selling cars. I hate the way people look at me. I got to start acting like I'm successful right here, right now, because nobody else was going to give me a job. And I was young, immature, you know, thought, thought, thought you know, acted more confident probably than I was. Uh, I still probably do that today. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, you know, one day I just said, okay, I, I, every dollar I make, I'm going to reinvest in myself. And I started learning and listening and met, getting mentors and, and surrounding myself with success. And I started acting successful. And next thing, my money changed a little bit. And when it changed a little bit, it gave me hope that it could change a lot. And then I started liking my job. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, wow, maybe I could learn this thing. Yeah, that's like the self-reinforcing circle. You got into the circle that started reinforcing itself. Yeah, yeah. And that's why you like that commit first, figure the rest out later. Because everybody's trying to figure it out. Mm -hmm. It's like people talk to me. They're like, man, how do you write four books in four years? I wrote my first book was written in three hours. Mm -hmm. And they're like, (laughs) how do you write a book in three hours? Uh, You sit down and you start writing. Right. That's what you do. How do you finish a book? Most people start books. Actually, most people don't buy books today because they didn't finish the last one they bought. And why? Because like, like, because you never make a decision when to finish the book. Mm -hmm. You made a decision to start the book. You didn't make a decision to finish it. So now when I buy a book and I I read a lot of books in the front of it, I'll put my finish date on it because I already know my start date. It was when I opened it and um, commit first. And then you figure the rest out later, you know, what it's going to cost you, how you're going to do it. Most of us don't know what we're doing or how we're going to do it. 
we just made a decision to do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, fantastic. That's good advice. Well, Grant, talk about this commit first and figure it out later. Let's drill down on that one because I think that's so meaningful. You know, so many people, they, they want to figure it all out beforehand. It's like, okay, let's write a business plan. Let's write a business plan for, you know, this business idea or for our whole lives. And the fact is nobody can figure it out because you don't know what's going to happen along the way. You just got to dive in and do it, right? You're so right. We I just finished. I'm creating a, a digital TV internet website, okay? Basically, it's a digital station. It's something that hasn't been done very much yet. I mean, this is, this whole space of digital is like consuming TV and radio. And and so we're in the office right now and they're telling, I said, hey, when's this site going to be up? And they're like, month, two months. I'm like, have you figured on all the stuff that's going to go wrong? <laughs> yeah. And they're like, what do you mean? I said, we don't know what we're doing. Okay. We just know we're going to do it. And look, if you, I own four businesses, all of them do in excess of $10 million a year in sale sales in revenue. They were all started from scratch. I have never, ever written a business plan because I know whatever you write down, I mean, it might make you feel warm and fuzzy. Look, you're not, you don't even know enough to write the stuff that's going to have monsters and demons and, and the things you need to worry about. You don't even know yet. Okay. So spending time on a business plan, Oh, I'm going to go to these people. I'm going to talk to these people. Look, three months from now, you won't even be worried about those things. It's going to be so many things happen, you know, because I even told my internet department, have y'all planned on, uh, you know, um, what what was the the thing, Lisa? Malaria or meningitis or the next, because something's going to happen and nobody plans on all that stuff. And so I'm with you, man. I've never spent any time on a on a business plan. And look, I've done things that were as simple as me just going up, going out and kind of making it up as I go to doing huge, huge real estate deals where there's hundreds of millions of dollars involved and still not had a business plan. Knowing I had to construct that kind of as I went, but I had to commit first. And then I could start figuring things out after the commitment, as esoteric as that might sound. Everything starts with a commitment. And then from there, we iterate and iterate and iterate to to get to where we want to go. Yeah, that's good. Well, tell us about the 10x rule in general, Grant, if you would. That's one of the keys to the 10x rule. But there are so many of them. I mean, that book is awesome. It's just got, it, you have so many entries in the table of contents. There's there's just a lot to it, a lot of meat there. Oh, thank, thank, thank you. Now, and you listen to the the audio. The audio, yeah. yeah. Well, the audio was done about six months after the book was finished. And that's when I'm getting a lot of feedback from readers. I mean, any anybody that writes a book, if you have a, if you if you've sold books before, not just written books, because a lot of people write them. Very few people can sell books, and um, once you start selling books, that means people are reading them. Okay, then you start getting feedback. So I waited six months and recorded this to include the questions people are asking us. Like, hey man, I got it. Okay, the ten x rule. I'm supposed to do ten times more what I think I'm going to do. Yeah, but do you know what that means? And the guy's like, well, what do you mean? I said, well, do you know when you're doing 10X times what's normal? And he's like, no, I don't. I said, because you'll immediately have new problems. So, so like you want new problems. The 10X rule is based on, based on a concept that, that the goals, targets, and actions that people are setting are so beneath them. They're so low, basically based on their potential, is that, that people become unexcited over time about that target. And so you don't, you find yourself not having the juice to complete things or you don't wake up excited on, you know, day 27 because I believe the target was too low. Now, while your parents are going to tell you that you need to set realistic goals, when they tell you that you need to ask them, Hey, how'd that work out for you? Yeah, right. You know, because, because really highly successful people. Okay. Uh, The Carlos Slims, the Bill Gates, the Steve Jobs. I mean, the people that are really super successful, if you tell them you want to be worth a billion dollars and you're 17 years old, they're not going to look at you like you're weird. They're not going to say, oh, that's ridiculous. You know, if you tell these guys you want to, you know, basically cure mm-hmm. uh, a disease, they're not going to say ridiculous because their think is so giant. Uh, unfortunately, most people, Jason, are getting advice and feedback from people that don't dream anymore and don't have goals. The 10X rule, rule as you know, basically re-inspires the individual to think way bigger uh, about their goals, their targets, and their actions. Okay, so give us an example of like, how big should it be? You know, you say that people don't set their goals high enough, Grant. And and so then they're kind of moderately excited about it. They're not really, really juiced, right? So, I mean, can a goal be too high? Can it be ridiculous? Can it be, you know? No, I don't think, 
it, they're all ridiculous, man. Look, I mean, a, a beggar's on the street corner of L.A. You know, he's at Fairfax and 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 Hollywood, and he's like, he's begging for a dollar. Completely ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, why would I give anybody this? Why would I stop my car, pull over, and give a guy I don't know one dollar? Mm-hmm. Okay. And it's not because I don't have the dollar. It's not because I'm not generous. It's because I don't have the time, dude. I'm rolling through a light. Mm-hmm. It's just, it, that's a ridiculous target. Another guy says, well, now I want to make a million dollars. All I'm telling people is this. Whatever your target is, let's say a financial target. Let's say the target's a million dollars. I'm like, dude, multiply times 10. 10 is a power number. No, nobody, no, no, wherever you go, okay? Numbers don't lie. 10 is a power number. It, it, it multiplies things at enormous numbers. And so I'm like, look, rather than writing a business plan for 1 million, why don't you write one for 10 million? <laughs> why, why would I do that? Because they're both ridiculous, dude. It's all freaking crazy, okay? You're going to be broke no matter which one of these you achieve. And he's like, what do you mean? You get a million dollars, you're going to feel like a broke man. You get to $10 million, you're going to feel like a broke man. Because your ideas... Okay, possibilities, your potential changes as you go up the food chain. You know, when you were 10 years old, you had a different kind of swag than you're going to hopefully have when you're 20 and a different one at 30 and 40 and 50 and 60. You know, the, 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 the deal is to stay excited. The, the people that are most excited are going to win the game. And so the 10x rule just says multiply. You want to make 100 million? Multiply times 10. Come up with a plan for a billion dollars instead. Because it's all work. So there's this middle class thinking, and you talk about that in the 10X book, you know, breaking out of the middle class and the incomes of the middle class. Tell us about that. Well, I'm talking about the, 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 the I'm starting to allude to another book that I'm working on right now. It's called The Middle Class, Basically Get Out. Mm-hmm. That, that, that what your parents, and part of why people think is so small is because your parents basically were going they, they were trying to build a lifetime of what's called the middle class to get into the middle class, particularly the last 40 or 50 years in America has been a construction of this idea that if I can just get into this club, the middle class, I'm going to be safe. We might have, we got good schools for the kids. We got two cars. We got a house we live in for our whole life. And, and you know, we retire and we check into our IRA account and everything's going to be good and our Keo's good. And then we're going to go on vacations and we're going to live happily ever after. And, and dude, that's a fantasy, man. This is no different than Cinderella and then the three little bears. The three bears, okay? For instance, Goldilocks, I think, was involved in that transaction, right? <laughs> you know, the, 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 the Goldilocks and the three bears is a mythology of the middle class. The real, the real middle class is like this, okay? Three bears come home, find Goldilocks, pull her freaking apart, label her for being a thief, kill her right there, and have her after the porridge as dessert. And they all laugh about it. Ah, we killed that little white girl, didn't we? So, so um, what I'm saying is the middle class is a myth. It's a mythology. It's based on average. It's based on average uh, education, average income, average savings. Everything's got to go right. If everything's perfect, if we don't live too long, everything's going to be fine. It's a myth that has been perpetuated by, by uh, politics, right and left, Republicans and Democrats, to let the masses of people know, 250 million, everything's all right. You're better off than the people in Egypt. Yeah, right. You know, there's stability here. It's just a big propaganda machine. The only place you want to be now is in the upper crust of the middle class, rich, or very, very wealthy. Because everybody else is paying a price. They just can't tell you that. Well, you know, Grant, especially nowadays, because the middle class has been shrinking in America for quite a few years now. If you look at the stats, uh, working Americans that are working regular J-O-Bs just over broke, they really are just over broke, J-O-B job, right? They haven't really had an increase in real dollar pay in a couple of decades. I mean, this is nuts. The middle class is just shrinking. It's under attack. Lou Dobbs wrote a great book called War on the middle class. And, you know, I've said that in my seminars for years. It's like, you better make a very conscious decision to be above the middle class because the middle class is leaving you. And that whole concept of, you know, I know this girl I used to date. I'll give you an example. You know, she lives in Newport Beach. Her parents live in Newport Beach, grew up there. Nice life, you know, and I'd call that upper middle class even. And she thinks by being a school teacher and just sort of being mediocre and walking through life, that she's going to have that same same lifestyle her parents had, you know, that built a bunch of real estate equity over the years and retired playing golf and traveling. And I mean, it's like, she's just fooling herself. There's no way that's going to exist for her, you know, when she she gets to that age. These are things people need to believe in. I mean, you know, I want to believe in it. It's like telling a kid, you know, oh, she's a little girl. She can believe in Santa Claus. Yeah, but sooner or later, 
you know, the difference between kids and adults is sooner or later, the kid finds out there's no Santa Claus. Adults actually don't know. This white chick that you're talking about in Orange County, I know she's white and I know she's votes Republican. <laughs> Blonde hair and blue eyes. <laughs> totally, right? And she's like, oh, everything's going to be all right. And right. if it's just, if it, if it was just for, if Obama, when Obama gets out, everything's going to be all right. No, it's not, baby. Both, both sides are crushing the middle class. Oh, of course they are. Because yeah. the middle class doesn't work. It never worked after the Industrial Revolution. There was, there's no expansion in America. America. We don't have anything to sell in this country except servicing people. And so, uh, you know, the middle class basically is getting shipped overseas. You got to get rich now. I mean, I, I don't know how to tell people this other than I was with Steve Harvey in Atlanta. I'm like, he's like, what's your message to people? Get rich. Okay. Or, or, or you're going to spend a life just crying and say, oh my God, what happened? You got to get rich now. It's the only safe haven. And anybody, anybody can get rich. If you know how to live poor, or just get by, I've done both, you can learn how to get rich. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great point. I just I just totally love it. So habitually commit. You know what I like, Grant? And, and you, you're you probably going to uh, like this one too, is that movie with Jim Carrey, Yes Man. Yeah, yeah. When you just say yes to more stuff in life, good things seem to somehow happen. Yeah, totally. You know, my mom, before my mom died, I, everything I would ask her to do, she'd always say no first. You know, when you get older, you start getting even more and more negative. And I think that's going, I think that's getting younger and younger for people today. But, Maybe. Um, it's just, just say yes, man. Say yes and figure it out later. There's everybody listening's had the experience of saying yes to your girlfriend, your boyfriend, your family, showing up for some event that you didn't want to, and leaving three or four hours later, bitching about it the whole way over there and on the way home, saying, "You know, I'm really glad you talked me into this." Yeah, right. I'm glad I got out of the house and met yeah, some exactly. people or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. So habitually commit. Does that mean don't be cautious? It means just jump in no matter what. I mean, no, I would definitely not be cautious. I'd be the most dangerous person in my environment. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I think people need to be dangerous. I have two little girls. I got a five-year-old and a three-year-old and, and the nanny comes in. The nanny says, now be careful, Sabrina. And Sabrina says, Papa, nanny just said to be careful. Isn't she dumb? And I'm like, that's right, baby. We're dangerous around here. You got to be dangerous. You want me to be the most dangerous person in your environment. Cautious is actually costing people everything. And this, again, goes back to this middle class, you know, don't fly too high, uh, stay low, don't get too much attention, don't take too many risks. Taking, not taking risk today is actually the riskiest thing you can do. And, and so it's uh, all these ideas that we were taught, like don't talk to strangers. Why? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, because it's dangerous. Why? Because of what, because that psycho chick on HLN every night uh, talks about somebody that took their wife out and killed them, you know? Uh, what's her name? Uh, Nancy Grace. Okay, Nancy Grace. And she's made hundreds of millions of dollars off of terrifying the public. Most people are not pedophiles. Okay, so so like my kids, I don't, I don't, I'm not on top of my kids every second of every day. I had I had a nightmare last night that one of them walked in a traffic. The three year old walked in the traffic, and I never found out whether she got hit by the car or she made it to the other side of the night. But I woke up, you know, terrified. I'm like, oh my god, I'm teaching them to be dangerous, and I'm like. But I'm not going to teach them to stand on the sidewalk. I'm not going to teach them that every time they walk across the street, they could get hit. Right. It's just ridiculous. I'm not going to teach my kids that every stranger should be a threat to you. Because the truth is, every stranger on this planet, the strangers have everything you want. Your dreams, the ideas you have, if you're going to make them possible, it's because of somebody you don't yet know. And, and so don't be cautious. Throw that caution, caution to the wind and go meet the people you need to meet. Well, isn't that a great point you're making, Grant? Because I remember hearing the old saying, strangers are just friends you haven't met yet. And if you think about it, it goes way back to like, you know, good old Jim Rohn, right? The late, the late great Jim Rohn, which I'm, I'm sure you're a fan of Jim's. And, you know, he said, your income will be the average of the five people People you spend the most time with. So how could we possibly improve our situation if we don't go meet some new people? Unless we're hanging out with billionaires already, then we got to go out and meet some strangers and hang out with strangers. Yeah. Uh, and notice the billionaires. The billionaires are always traveling off somewhere to meet somebody new because they're trying to do hookups, man. They're trying to do deals. See, see, they say knowledge is power. No, knowledge is not power. Okay. The power, because I know too many people with no knowledge, they got power. The power is in the hookup. And the hookups aren't at your house, okay? I'm not talking about utilities, electrical, water. I'm talking about the hookups. The only reason to go to college today is to meet the players. There's only three or four or five colleges maybe worth going to because that's where the, the, the blue blood goes. That's where that old money goes. That's where the hookups are. And, and the difference between a, uh, a contact and a contract today is a relationship, that R, 
it's the people, man. And the people you know today cannot help you. It's the people I don't know. And, and every day I make a list. Who can I meet today? Who can I meet today? Today, hey, I get to meet Jason Hartman, okay? Who do I meet today that can change my life tomorrow? And I guarantee you, my friends, my, but my buddies, the people I know, the people I had wine with or dinner with this weekend will not change my life tomorrow. It's going to be somebody I don't yet yeah, know. You know, that's an awesome philosophy. Okay, so just to follow up to that, Grant, what advice do you have to, with someone who's sitting here listening to this and they're thinking, you know what, that's true. The light bulb went on for them. They go, I got to meet some new people. That's the way I'm going to improve my situation. How do they decide who they need to meet? How do they approach them? Yeah, I, what I would do is make a list. I'd make a list every day. Who can help me? Who can help my career? Look, I'm a selfish, greedy person, okay? I'll say it before anybody else says it. I am selfish and I am greedy and you should be too. <laughs> no problem. You should, make, you should make a list. But you see how we were taught not to be that? Yeah, I know. Yeah. You know, don't get too much attention either, Jason. Right. Yeah, but you know what? Look at the Kardashians. They're going to make, two, she's going to make 200 million off her little freaking apps game that yeah. just came out. Unbelievable. Why? Because yeah. she gets attention right. because she's like, look, this is my life, dude. It ain't your life. And I'm going to make it into something big. Yeah. And quit apologizing to her about it. You know, just go for it. Yeah, exactly. Hate me. You hate me. Everybody hates you. Got less than her. So, so, um, I would just tell people, look, make a list every day. Who do you need to meet that would change your life? Well, hopefully my name's on your list now. Okay, hit me up at Twitter at Grant Cardone. I'll, I'll respond to you. So, so make a list every day. Who could I meet today in my community? Maybe they're at church. Maybe they're in government. Maybe, who can you meet? Who can you send a letter to, an email to, a text to? Who could you tweet today that would change your life tomorrow? And then, and then maybe while you're out in the marketplace, may, you know, meet five strangers uh, that, 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 and you're going to find out they didn't fondle you. You know, wow, man, that person didn't. Right. Oh, yeah. my God, that, that person. Didn't. I didn't get molested when I met a new stranger. Yeah. And, and, and some of the ladies listening are going to be like, ah, I'm hurt and rejected now. Right. Yeah. But, but you know, it, 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 you're going to find out that like people aren't people are scared to death. Just if you walk up, they think you're freaking psycho mm -hmm. because that's how that's how um, introverted and small thinking our culture has become where everybody's just kind of paying attention to their own little thing and then wonder why they don't get anything because everything you want is outside your comfort zone. Yeah. Everything. Yeah. That's awesome. That is totally awesome, Grant. Okay. Uh, pick another favorite concept of yours, whether it be from 10X or it be from uh, your brand new book. Uh, Sex, you know, man. Whatever. Okay. <laughs> is that in the book? <laughs> it could be. 10X. <laughs> 10X. All right. No, just whatever you want. Just to kind of wrap 10X up condoms, with. man. That'd be good. That'd be good. Those would go good. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't can make, see I, a new I, product I, launch here. <laughs> oh, my God. 10X condoms by Grant Cardone. <laughs> Video and audio included. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, think big. <laughs> I hope your audience can handle all this, okay? <laughs> it's all right. It's all right. It's good. But, but, you know, like wrap us up with one other great concept from any of your work, any of your books, doesn't matter. You know, or, you know, maybe if it's not even published yet. Yeah, I would tell you, I would tell people like, look, you got to get alive now, okay? I mean, you got to get alive right now. You got to get like so engaged in the deal. You got to get so jacked up. You got to be like, you got to have this, I, I would just call it the three words, whatever it takes, whatever it takes. Okay. I mean, whatever it takes. Now, the first thing, when I say that, you know, Jason, what's the first thing you think of when I say whatever it takes? A little part of me says, oh, this is ridiculous. Come on. I don't want to work that hard. Or, you know, I don't want to sacrifice other areas of my life. Yeah, you know, yeah, that's yeah. like all the bad conversation that's going on. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Or, or people that, that it, people will say, oh, yeah, but I'm not going to be unethical. Well, I'm yeah. not talking about being yeah, unethical. Right, right. That's another one. And, Good point. And most people have already, uh, you know don't have the life they want. So, so I mean, people always tell me that, oh man, if I go all out on this, I'm not going to get, what about this part of my life? Dude, you're already unhappy in that part of your life. Why are you kidding yourself? Okay. Look, there, there's 7 billion people that will line up and lie to you. Don't, don't be in your own line. Okay. Get honest that nobody is doing whatever it takes to get the life they want. And it's worth it, whatever it takes. And by the way, I'm not going to, I'm not going to have part of life. I, I want everything to be 10X. I want my finances to be 10X. I want my wife, my marriage to be sent at 10X. I want to be as a parent. I want to, I want to have it great in every area, not one or two. And I'm going to do whatever it takes. Nine out of 10 things I do on a daily basis, I don't want to do. 
Okay. Most of the things that I do every day, I do not want to do. I was telling Steve Harvey this the other day. Steve's like, Steve's got three hours of radio every day. He does four hours, four or five hours every day of family feud. Uh, he hadn't been home in like three years, hadn't eaten breakfast in his home. I'm like, Hey man, how many times, how many things you do a day that you don't want to do? And he looked at me, he's like, Oh my God, I'm glad I finally met somebody that understands every day, no matter where you're at, you have to be willing to do whatever it takes. And that includes the stuff you don't want to do. And I know you know this, that you just, you know, these ideas that they, they just do what you love and then success will show up. Look, you got to be willing to do a lot of stuff you don't love, you don't want to do, and you hate to do if you really want success. And that's what I would tell people to do, whatever mm -hmm. it takes. That's a great thing. And it's funny how you'll learn to be okay with and actually sometimes love or at least delegate the things you don't like to do. They're really just not that hard once you dive in and do them. You'll be in a position now. You're, first of all, the marketplace is going to see you as an, a unique individual. They're going to start valuing you. They're going to start paying you more than you think you're worth. And, and you're going to start getting breaks that other people don't get get breaks and and because people this this commodity this idea that you would do whatever it takes show up early stay late make the extra call uh go out and do the things you're uncomfortable it, it is a rare breed of people that are willing to do whatever it takes to get the job done hey grant give out uh your different websites i know you've even got a great iphone app that i downloaded and you know just any of your stuff so people can find you and uh you know find out all about yeah you, you could go it, look if you google grant cardone my name, Grant Cardone, then you can find out everything about me. There's a great site right now with a free video download called Tired of Missing Sales, tiredofmissingsales.com for organizations and salespeople. And there's also a university called CardoneUniversity.com for anybody that wants help branding, marketing, sales, negotiating. If you want help getting more money, it's called CardoneUniversity.com. We got 1,100 videos on YouTube. Go to YouTube, throw my name in there. Twitter, I beat it up all day long. I mean, they're about to ban me on Twitter, I think. <laughs> you know, I'm not hard to find, man. Good stuff. All right, awesome. Grant Cardone, thank you so much. Much success to you and uh, really inspiring stuff. Keep up the great work. Thank you so much for listening. Please be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss any episodes. Be sure to check out the show's specific website and our general website, hartmanmedia.com, for appropriate disclaimers and terms of service. Remember that guest opinions are their own. And if you require specific legal or tax advice or advice in any other specialized area, please consult an appropriate professional. And we also very much appreciate you reviewing the show. Please go to iTunes or Stitcher Radio or whatever platform you're using and write a review for the show. We would very much appreciate that. And be sure to make it official and subscribe so you do not miss any episodes. We look forward to seeing you on the next episode.